and then go ahead and share my screen. And there we are. Okay, I hope everybody's got it. If you don't speak up, let me know. I'm going to adjust my screen on the other side here. There we go. Okay, so today's the 14th. We're going to go through a um, little bit of what we're going to go through today. Um, talk about the processes. Now, for most of you, um, there isn't much change from last year. There's one change with the how we're going to handle missing documents. We'll talk through that. For those of you where this is your first year, please do not be intimidated or daunted. Um, I've got everything in here, so it's all documented. But in reality, once you go through, do your first couple of returns, first couple interviews, the process will be pretty, I hope it'll be pretty uh, straightforward for you. You understand it. So the fact that I'm going through listing all the steps here should not intimidate or worry anybody. And for those of you that are familiar with it, um, just a re refresher, and if anything's coming up, you say, I don't think we did it that way or whatever, you know, speak up and we can have a discussion. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to handle amended and uh, people come in wanting to do prior years. We'll talk a little bit about the Iowa taxes for 2022, since that'll be our next training in a couple of weeks. And then we'll go over those last two scenarios that I sent out. Okay, so some quick notes for the presentation and shorthand, if you see through there, um, basically IP means in person. If I use that, NIP is not in person, then I want to write that out 30 times. Intake is only for not in person, but if you're doing an interview, that applies to both in person and not in person. Um, we're not going to go, when I say not go over, we're not going to go through a process on how to do prior year returns. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, in other words, I'm not going to go through 2021 training. Um, uh, we'll talk about, again, later on what, what we want to do about that. If you're in doubt about any of these processes, uh, when you're doing this, you know, you got your select site coordinator. And if there's other volunteers that have been around, they'll be more than happy to, to step you through and help you out, get through the process. I missed one out-of-scope item last week. That name, image, likeness thing for athletes, um, that is out-of-scope for us. So if they show up with a 1099 NEC that's out of that's and name image license income, we cannot do their uh, taxes. I don't think we'll see any professional athletes, but potentially it could be a college or even it's even gone down to high school in some cases, but I don't think we'll see it. But just so you know, at this point, they're not letting us do those. And I'm going to put a reminder in now and at the end of the presentation to please, if you haven't gone in and get your shift sign up because Meredith like this weekend or first thing Monday or Tuesday wants to get things solid so she can go releasing sign up dates for people to sign up and start getting clients signed up for sessions. Um, and I don't know if she was a little concerned about not having all the um, open slots available that we had last year. And I don't know if that's just a function of volunteers or how much people are willing to sign up for. Um, the other thing she has to do is balance out people who are doing intake versus people doing having preps or not overloaded on one um, aspect or the other. Intake interview, and this applies to both in process and, and in person and not in person. Starting out, we always wanna verify the photo ID their tax, for the taxpayer and the spouse if they're doing a joint return. It needs to be a government issued document. And even if the greeters looked at them as the preparer or the interviewer, you want to see those documents too. Verify social security numbers or tax identification numbers, including the any dependents are claiming. If you're doing not in person, get copies of those photo and tax on the photo for the driver's license or whatever, get copies of their IDs and make sure they know what the process is going to be especially if they're doing that in, not in person, that they're not surprised saying, wait, you're not doing my taxes today? No, we're not doing your taxes today. You're handing them off, you're going to sign this form, and you're going to come back in a couple of weeks and pick them up. And the other folks make sure that they understand that they're still going to sit down and talk with a quality reviewer. 
sometimes they think, you know, they sit down and talk with you. That's great. They walk out. No, you got to wait and talk to somebody else. Go through the 13614C that they should have filled out. Verify all the birthdays. That is a common thing that with legibility and especially with kids. If they got two or three kids, I've had them um, more than once get the birthday swapped out or swap the, if it's June 3rd, they'll write 36 instead of 63. And our, so you have to make sure you got all the dates right. Um, again, obviously, as it's stated in our uh, training for the certification stuff, get all the unsure questions set to yes or no. Verify uh, their choices for refund or payments, and I put date in red. But um, because that's frequently something that burns us, is if they're going to be paying and have it automatically taken out, they don't give us a date to tell the IRS to take it out. So you have to make sure that is done. And then new for this year, we do want to make sure that voting question is answered yes or no. We're not going to do too much personally with it, but if it is yes, we just have to say here's a either an information sheet or we're going to point them to talk to somebody else there in the room saying, yeah, go talk to this person about voting, or here's a sheet that can help you out with voting. If you're not busy, um, they can sit at your table and help fill out the sheet. If you don't have a client, they're getting, usually that's the occasion with the very first client, they're coming in, and if you're not doing anything yet, they can sit at your table and fill out the sheet. You may need to directly help them if there, especially if there isn't a greeter. You may have to answer some, you know, clarify some questions and explain what some questions mean. Other important thing: Do they prefer text or a call for contacting them? Most, 90% of them these days are text, but they, we still do get some retirees, some elderly folks that only have landlines. So you want to jot on that 1340, but usually up by the phone number and say T or text or a phone number or L for landline, no text, basically. So we know how we're going to contact those folks if we have to. And if you can't get any kind of phone number, then talk with the site coordinator to figure out what is our way to go contact those folks. Because we have to have some way of getting done for them. Now we hope besides mail. Uh, the email or some other contact. Maybe they have another friend we can call. Um, we've had that happen. Say, no, I don't have a phone, but call my daughter and she can get in touch with me. That has happened before. Explain about carry forward for 15080. This is the last sheet of that yellow document. It's, act it's, it's attached to it, but it's actually a different document than the 13614C. When they, if they accept this, it means their data is available to any VITA site. And if they want to know it, that, that permission lasts through the November of the following year. It doesn't affect their current taxes. If they don't want to sign that, they still, still do their taxes. It doesn't affect anything. It's just if they go somewhere else and come back next year, we got to do it all over again. They don't have any head start with their data. Note that they don't actually sign the 13614C. That's interesting. The signature is actually on that 15080 form. If they do not have a social security or an ITIN card with them, we do work with the following. If they got their social security form with them, we will accept that. As long as they get the photo ID, we know for sure who they are. We will accept that for the social security number. If they have any official letter from the social security or IRS that has their full social security number on it, we will accept that with their name and that on it. We do occasionally, if we're confident, we can accept the social security number if they have the last year's return. And this especially happens with dependents. Sometimes the kid, they don't have that kid's social security card with them. But if the kid was on last year's return and the social security number's there, we will use that. But double check to make sure that that return was accepted as it is. Because we print out a return, we submit it. If it gets rejected, they say, oh, we had a bad social security number. We'll correct it and, send, and resubmit it. But we will not reprint that return. So they come back next year with that return. Conceivably, it could have that bad number on it. So you want to make sure that's a good return if you're going to use that as a source. If you use anything besides the original cards for this information, put a note somewhere 
so that the QR person or the NIP preparer uh, is aware of what you use to get that information. And verify the name for the primary taxpayer. And we'll talk more about this when we go through O'Connor and stuff. Two aspects for that. I'll talk more about it later. Uh, names. <clears throat> Sometimes what they have for their name isn't what the IRS had in the previous, not exactly what they had on the previous year's return. So it gets a little tricky. And also sometimes they swap on you with spouses. The spouse will have one name on top the first year and the spouse second, the, and the other person will be at the, the secondary. And they come in the next year and they fill out the 614 different because the spouse is the first one that got the form and they put their name on top. So make sure you know who, if there's two of them, you make sure who you want listed first on the tax return because it does not always the same as the 13614 and sometimes they swap on you. And the, the thing about that is if you don't use the same name, it will not pull the previous year's information forward. If the one, if person A did it last year and you go, we're gonna use person B this time, we're gonna swap them. It's not gonna pull up their return from last year because you're because they're gonna go by person B's social security number and it won't find that as the primary taxpayer. So just be aware of those. If they say, well, I did it last year. Yeah, you did, but we swapped people. So no, we can't pull it forward. You can change them after you pull it up. So you could put person one in there, pull the information forward, and then, then go into basic information and swap the names and the, and the social security numbers. You can do that. So I don't know if that happened too often, but you do have that option. Why would you want to? Because to pull up previous year's return. If the re if last year's return was under was under the husband Joe, and the wife wants to put her name first this year, well, it's not going to pull up last year's return. So you put for Joe's first, pull up last year's return. Then you can go in and move the wife to the top position and put Joe in the second. Why would you want to move her to the top just because of the thirteen? Because they decided they want to. You go by their wishes. Oh, okay. She says, I want to be on top. their choice. Okay. I want to be the first list. Okay, we'll list you first. But uh, if you do that right away, it will not pull up last year's return. It's just their personal preference. If they do have a tax identification number card, instead of, instead of a Social Security, this is what those look like. Verify you have all the documents. Do you have everything based on what they're telling you on that, that 13614? Generally, if the third party, whether it's an employer or a financial institution, is, is providing information to the IRS, there should be a document. That's the general rule that if it's something that goes to the IRS from the from that third party, then they should that the client, the taxpayer, should have a document as well. And if something is missing, then we'll talk about that process in a little bit here. Other documents are always helpful, uh, but not required unless they can have them in notes. If you, they can have them in their own notes, so you can take their word for it. If they're reasonable receipts from colleges, things like car registration, property tax, if they got the documents for those, great. If not, if they've written it down or they tell you and it's a reasonable number, again, it's their tax return, we will accept that, but make sure you write down in your notes where you got the number from. A lot of people come in, I'll bring in a whole bunch of documents. We will never make fun of folks for bringing in documents. You just thank them kindly and say, you yeah, know, it's really great you're thorough and you brought these in, but these 20 documents I really don't need. And you hand them back to them. They bring all, all sorts of stuff and we don't want to discourage people from bringing stuff in. So we just kindly say, okay, we're done. Thank you, take these back. We don't want things we don't need put into the envelope. So you also use the intake form for capturing data, especially if you don't have other documentation. The more information in one place for the either the not in person preparer or the QR people, the better. You can take notes on the intake form. You can take that's where I did just for the examples because it was easy for me. You can, there's a spot on the back of the 13614C. You can take notes. My personal favorite I like to do if you got if I got a photocopy of the 
driver's license and social security number. I'll fill that with notes because I know the preparer is going to look at that. So it's just write the stuff down somewhere. You can never, never be shy about taking notes. Making sure don't assume somebody's going to figure it out because you're because it's obvious to you in front of when you're the client sitting there. Make sure it's who they understand. Examples um, bank information. Debit cards do not have a bank account information on them. We will frequently get a client, you want from bank, they'll give you their debit card and say, oh, here's my bank stuff. No, I'm sorry, that doesn't do it. Um, the best thing, you obviously, sometimes they have a card that's not a debit that says, oh, here's your account information. That's great. Uh, check is great. Deposit slips are not reliable for bank routing numbers. Sometimes it does match up with the correct bank. Sometimes they use a different routing number that deposits them for some, for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. But uh, debit cards and deposit slips are not what we want to use to confirm bank information. Uh, I should have said last year's return. If it's on last year's return and their money came through, I always ask them, did your money show up? Yep. Okay. Uh, I should list that. I'll add that to last year's tax return is also a valid source for bank information. If they had cash income, self-employed expenses, uh, out-of-pocket medical, charity, college, other school, and all this stuff is things we want to take notes on, either because they gave us a sheet with notes or we took our own. Any questions on that stuff? If at any time you come across something that is out of scope, verify it in Pub 412 and consult with the site coordinator what you want to do with that. Um, if it is out of scope, then you're going to explain and apologize to the client, tell them why and say, I'm sorry. And it, it's very simple. Say so the IRS will not let us do this. Say, so, but you know how it doesn't matter if I know how, the IRS will not let us do this, I'm sorry. Um, any photocopies or notes that we made, you can either return them to the client or we can shred them. We give them all their documents back. Um, we are not in the business of recommending other places to go for their tax prep. We can't say, oh, we'll just go down the street here to the nation or black or go over to Liberty. You know, we can tell them there are other places available and give them examples that we do not recommend. When they, if this happens, we keep that 13614C and clearly write on it that this person, because that's our record, they walk through our door and they sat down with us, but write on it, we have an out of scope situation. Now, the intake form, I didn't, I'm not going to step, I wasn't going to step through it. I didn't put it in the presentation, but this is all the intake. Did anybody have any questions or concerns on that intake form that we're going to be using this year? I can bring it up and talk about it if somebody does have a question or a concern on it. Okay. Yeah, I guess I had a question of when do we fill that out? During this interview. Um, okay. Basically, you're fair, this whole point of, verifying that you have all the information. And if it's not a document that they've already handed you, and even then make notes otherwise captured on there. Um, if they give you a list of medical expenses, you know you can add them up and put them on that sheet. If uh, they got their car registration sheet, you figure out what the deductible part is, you write it on there. Uh, any other notes, everything you can that makes to make it easy for the preparer or the QR person when they go back through that. But you're only going to use it when you do when you're doing an intake. You're not going to do it when you're doing person to person. Yeah, I would. I would. It's going to help the QR person. It's going to help the QR you're person. You're going to do the intake sheet when you're doing person to person. I would. I'm not going to. I would recommend it because if I was QR, <laughs> I would love having that sheet instead of me having to go back and add up all the medical costs again to make sure that they input it right. I would love having that sheet in front of me if I'm doing QR. Um, you're, you're obviously time having you don't personal agree with that. Confident, having personal confidential information on an additional sheet of paper is, is, in my opinion, a very bad choice. You give it back to them when you're done. There's nothing um, on that sheet that's secret for us. When you're done, you put it in the envelope and they take it with them. It's the same thing, and that's the same whether it's NIP, not in person or in person. That sheet, either we give, either we shred it or we put it in the envelope and they take it with them. Plus, I would, I would say that 
it makes it easier for the QR person. If you're doing in person, you don't have to go back to that person that prepared, which might interrupt another intake interview or preparation since you're doing in person at the time. It just streamlines the process for everybody. The key point here is getting all capturing all the information, whether you do it writing on the photo on the on the 13614C in the notes field, and to make it as as clear as possible to that QR person, no matter whether it's not in person or in person, the QR looking at that repair saying, yep, here's where this data came from. I'm not going to make you re-add up all the medical costs. I'm not going to make you go recalculate the value on that car registration. I got it done for you. Here's the numbers. And wherever it's convenient for you to write that down and make it available, that's what you use. That intake sheet is a convenience to try and make it streamlined and make sure we don't have to go back and ask people questions. Nobody's going to look over your shoulder and say, you have to fill out the intake sheet. The goal is to make it easier for the prep person and easier for the QR person. Hey, Mark, um, if we're doing a not in person intake and we do like they have eight charity pieces, if we total them all up and write them on that, do we give them back those at that time or do you wanna keep them just in case you need to check them when they're prepared? Eventually, we're going to give it back to them, but at the point I would put a paper clip on them and I would keep them in the envelope. Okay. And just write that you totaled them up or something. Yeah, write that I totaled them up. And yeah, they gave me, they usually for small stuff they don't have, if they've got it written down, sometimes like they give you a sheet, here's my charity. You just, I just usually circle the total and write it on the sheet saying, yep, verify it. Yep, that's $250 they gave. Okay. Thank you. It's not. Hey, Mark, you might you also can, add. You might also add that on the uh, government IDs, if the expiration date is not current, that makes that document invalid so that they would need to find a, a document that is current for a government ID. Good point. If they, if they see, look at the driver's license and it expired last year, um, you may have to have a check on that. Now, why would that matter? Um, just because but we're not like California and all them that have to enter it. No, but um, basically it's just the point that we, we are required to have a valid ID by the IRS to use a valid ID. A government issued valid ID in that in that case particularly is not it is not valid anymore. I I don't know, Tom, have you run into that? I have not. Sure. Yeah. They don't, they don't like to hear that, but, but I mean, it, it's a reality that, you know, you're actually doing them a favor by letting them know that their driver's license is, is out of date. What I would do in that situation is I would write a note, make sure it's all noted that this, but I would go ahead and actually do their process things through, but I would not have them sign and, and authorize for e-file until they came back with a valid ID. I would hold on to it. So if are they still valid for 30 days though after the expiration date to have them renewed like your driver's yeah. license? Yeah. So would we still consider that good if it, they're within their 30 days? Within their 30 days, yeah. But if it's last year okay. sometime, then I'd say, you know, we got an issue here. Okay. But in that case, and in that case, I mean, I, I would not turn them away. I'd say, look, we're going to get you ready here. I'll be set, but we can't actually send in your tax return until you get a until you get your like, driver's license renewed. All you gotta do is come back in without an appointment and show it to us and then we'll give you your, you know, give you your return and you're on your way and we'll submit it. Any other questions or concerns on that? Good discussion. But then I thought if they didn't have everything, we weren't gonna keep everything on the intake. No, but we're not going to give them their return and, and mark it for e-file. We give them everything back to walk away. But we have not printed their return and they have not signed the authorization for e-file. I'm, I'm talking just intake, not when you're physically there with them. Okay, I'm missing the question then. I'm sorry. 
because if they don't have everything, aren't we supposed to give everything back and then have them come back? Well, this they have something, but we're saying, yeah, I can't accept that right now. But I, I think we're a very good chance. You know, we're not saying, yeah, we're going to give everything back to them. But it, we'll talk about that I'll, I'll, when we get talk about the missing documents later on. Okay. I need to put them to talk about how that would fit into that. Okay. And I would remind you that we never give the 13614 back. That no. never leaves our our possession. And we'll talk about that. And when I get to missing documents, remind me that that includes we'll include uh, expired driver's licenses and that. And we'll go through that then. Okay, so now we've got our, all our information. We've gathered it all. Um, if we're doing it in person, now we've got everything. We start inputting the data into tax layer. Uh, sometimes even when you're putting in, you forgot about something or something comes up that you didn't catch during the interview. Um, we get that resolved. And usually, I'd say 80% of the time, the client wants to know when you're first done the prep, they want to know what, they're, what they owe or what the refund is. Fine, let them know. Uh, but remind them that QR still has to go over this. You tell them, yeah, this is what it looks like right now, but you have somebody going to double check it. So don't, you know, don't come back and scream at me later because it changed because we have a second person who looks at it. Then you set the tax player status flag to ready to review. You do not set the complete flag. They're close to each other. Uh, and you're set ready for a review. Um, prepare the envelope, write their phone, their name, their name, their phone number, and their text, no text choice. And I'll illustrate that in a little bit. Um, make sure the tax year and the site name are on the envelope, but all the relevant documents, the, the intake form and all your notes, give them the envelope and they have to wait for a QR person. They're not leaving with that. They got to wait for a QR person. And then if you got a greeter, let the greeter know this person's ready for QR, because usually that's one of the greeter things that we hope they do is they keep the first, you know, uh, first come first serve line ready for the QR people. Um, we are going to have stickers on all the envelopes because as I looked at those sites, talking with Meredith, all the sites are going to be doing that in person in some manner, doing intake. And so colored label envelopes will be standard on, on the envelopes. And while have a picture of that. We'll talk, they talk through that in a minute here. But if you're doing in person, you don't need to go initial that label. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Explain and um, have, if you're doing not in person at this point, explain the, the consent form, the 14446. This is our permission to keep their documents saying, hey, this is just acknowledging that we're not stealing your documents. We're going to hold on to them. You're going to get them all back. But this is just saying, we told you we're going to hang on to your documents to do your taxes. Prepare the envelope. Again, their phone name, phone number, text, no text, tax year and site name, get everything inside. And now you are going to initial and date that log label for intake. Put the promise date, two weeks on the log label. Write that on there, two weeks out. Okay. So now we're going to have a half sheet. We give the client saying, right, their name and their date on the date on it and the, and the two week out date. And those, those sheets should have information about the site, the hours, and the time that they can come back for the site. They do not need an appointment to come back, but anytime two weeks or later, they can come back and we should have their taxes ready. Then you put the envelope, it should be a specific location at every site, put the envelope there to go to the prep, to be prepped later on at a different site. Um, high, in Hiawatha, I think they're gonna prep them at the same site, but other places will probably go to a different site. When you say they can come back anytime, you should remind them that the hours for your site are whatever to whatever, so that they don't come back yeah. outside that those hours. It should be on the site. Make sure the site days and the hours should be on the sheet there. That's I don't know. That's one. Yeah, that's when we're open. Good reminder. So they would come back to the same site or the site. They should come back to the same site. Okay. 
we have made exceptions where something's happened and they had to do a different one, but those are case by case. And I don't really can think of one. I don't even think of one last year where the person wanted to, they were on the other side of town and something was happening. They had to pick it up at a different site. So we arranged to have the packet dropped off at the other site for them. I think that I can only recall one time that I was involved with that last year. Otherwise they come back to the same site. So here's what generally what the envelope's gonna look like. It should have the site name written on it. it, should have tax year 2022 written on it. Those should be, if they're not there, make sure they are. Then you add the client name. You add a phone number, hopefully we got a phone number. And you add the information, whether it's text, landline, how we can contact them. Because we don't wanna to have to go inside and dig out the information inside if we have to contact them. We want it on the outside on the form. We are putting the missing documents, if there are any, on the label this time, instead of a whole separate sheet. Those are the most common missing documents. And there's an other there if you run into other ones, plus you got, there's a notes field, which is actually longer. I cut it off here for this image. Um, but then you, if you do have missing documents, we'll talk about later, that's where you're gonna mark them up. And then as an intake person, if you are doing that in person, there's your date and initial, the next one's the promise date. And so that's where you're going to put your information about the, about the process. Because if you're doing it in person, you really don't, there's no promise date. You really don't have to initial those. But the missing document, even in, for in person, they have to go get a missing document. And other could be driver's license. Um, that's where they want to capture it on here. And we want to put it there so there's nothing's not going to get ripped off. It's not going to get lost. And you circle it or highlight it, and that lets them know, yep, I got to come back with this document. Okay, if it goes to the not in person prep site, the site coordinator decides the priority for what the envelopes are going to be processed. So, as a prep person, you take all the documents out of the envelope, look at the 13614C and all the intake notes, and you start working in tax layer. And then maybe you want to add. Again, there's still two people. There's you as the prep, there's QR. You may wanna add a few more notes for QR. That's perfectly acceptable. Go ahead and add some notes. Set the tax player stag flag for ready for review when you're done. And again, do not check complete. You put everything back in the envelope. You go back to that sticker. You put your date and initials as a preparer. And then you should have a location at that site to be able to uh, when that envelope is waiting for QR. It may be a file drawer, it may be a stack, whatever the site coordinator, coordinator is set up for that site. And now that is waiting for QR. So now at, not in person as a preparer now, you are done. But there are some issues that can come up with not in person. And these can happen either at prep or QR. You discover too late, we have missing documents that we didn't catch in the interview. Too late, we found it's out of scope. Should have caught that in the interview, we didn't. Too late, there's some information that I really wish the interviewer had put down there that I really need for prep. It's not in his notes, her notes. So you can talk there at the site. Maybe it's something you can resolve just talking among yourselves. If not, then you gotta use that phone number. You gotta contact the client. If you can't get a hold of them right away, you put a clear note on the envelope. In this case, a sticky note is acceptable or whatever. Um, as to what the issue is, and he should have a spot at each site, whether it's a part of a file drawer, saying these are the ones I'm waiting for an answer from the client. And then whoever finally does get that answer back from the client, um, then they should be able to find that and then put it back into the flow. Missing document. Uh, the envelope will stay at the not in person in the not in person prep site clearly identify the issue. When you do finally get in touch with the client, um, they have a couple options, and we'll talk about those options in a whole missing document section later. Um, they can either bring the physical documents to the intake site or to the prep site if they're not the same. If they take them to the intake site, which is where they dropped it all off in the first place, then the site coordinators have to coordinate to be aware of what's going on and get the docs moved from one site to the other when they arrive. Um, Occasionally we have them drop, I have had them drop off at the prep site 
but usually they bring them to the intake site and then we get them moved. If the notes aren't complete, uh, this is in other words, we're not looking for a document, but we have a piece of information that we're looking for saying that the, we want clarified. Envelope always stays at the NIP prep site. Uh, again, if this can't get a hold of the client, but a note that they set the envelope aside. When you do get in touch, they provide the misinformation and you update the information for that client. Then you put it back into the process, complete the return and finish the process. If it's out of scope, they've gone through the interview, they've dropped it off if it's not in person, they're not there, but you just gotta wait. Nope, this is out of scope. You put everything back in the envelope and clearly mark what the problem is on the envelope and on the 13614. Um, get the envelope back to the intake site, if it's a different site. The intake site then contacts the client, apologizes, says, hey, I'm sorry, we can't do your return. And this is really a, a bad one. I've had to do this. They've dropped it off. They've been waiting a week and a half and you call up and say, I'm sorry, we can't do your return. So we really avoid this. We really want to try to catch everything at the interview. Make sure the is marked as out of scope. When they come to pick everything up, we keep the 13614 and the consent form. Everything else goes back to them, return the envelope to the other documents. Um, we keep the 13614. We can keep the 14446 or we can shred it either way. That consent form though, but uh, that one we don't have to give back to the client. But we can shred it or we can hang on to it and put it, put it inside of the 13614 and put it in the file drawer, whatever. Okay, so now we've gone through all the intake, all the interview, we've gone through the prep, and now it's ready for quality review in either, in either flow. In-person quality review. You pull up the return and tax layer, you QR the return, the client is sitting there in front of you. Um, verify anything. If you've got any questions, verify if you need to with the client. If you have issues, you discuss them with the preparer. And that's not uncommon at all. Say, wait a minute, you can talk, hey, you know, um, come on over here and say, no, why did you put this number in here? It's not clear from your notes where you got it. And the preparer should be able to clarify. If it needs to be corrected, you correct it. When it's all done, you print the return. There should be a Vita print option in the dropdown. You mark that return as approved and complete. You pull out the e-file forms and any vouchers out of that print. Do not transmit it. There is a transmit button that's not too far from those approved and complete forms. Do not transmit that. You just mark it as approved as complete. If you're doing not in-person QR, again, pull up the return, QR it. You can discuss this. The repair should be at the same site. Hopefully, they're there at the same shift. If not, you may have to contact them and get an answer. Um, I hope the client doesn't need to be involved. Then we go through this thing of trying to contact the client or set them aside if you can't, and then correct if you need to. Again, do the VITA print. Pull out the e-forms and the file and the e-file signature forms, any vouchers, and then you staple the return. Again, market is approved and complete. You do not, please, please do not transmit it. Put everything into the envelope. You date and initial the log label and put it in an appropriate place. You should have an assigned spot for things to go back to the intake site or to be ready to go back to intake. If it's the same site, you should have a spot to be ready to be returned to the client. So now we've done QR, we've done interview, we've done prep, we've done QR. So now we're giving the client back the return. In either case, whether it's in person as a QR or whether it's at the intake when they come back in to pick it up. So now you got the client sitting in front of you again. So now you go through the return with them. You don't have to be super detailed, but you don't just say, here it is, sign, thank you, that's it. You step through, um, understand, you know, here's where your income, here's what, you know, here's what we came up with because sometimes they have questions. And that is why in other parts of the training, I've said, you know, tax layer takes care of all this, but it's nice for you to understand 
Because if the client asks, then you can say, well, you know, Social Security worksheet is at the back here, and that's where it says, yeah, you owe this much in taxable Social Security. Or no, you didn't get any child tax credit. Look, here's the worksheet. Your teenager aged out. I'm sorry. You're not going to get a child tax credit this year. Because um, those are the kind of questions you get. Remind them again, it's their return. We're helping them. We're doing everything as best we can. But uh, if the IRS comes knocking, they're responsible for it. Uh, verify the bank information. Again, especially that date, if they're going to use an auto debit um, to take the money out of their account. If anything is going to be e-filed, and that's 99% of the time, we have to witness the client signing those e-file forms, the Fed 8879 and the IO 8453. We witness them signing that. The client keeps these forms. Years ago, we used to keep them ourselves. The IRS said, no, you got to give them back to the client. I don't understand the logic on that, but that was the, the guidance we were given. So what we do is there is a will be a colored sticker. Um, Meredith loves to color coordinate stuff, so it will be coordinated up on the top there. And you can see TP there for the taxpayer. The taxpayer initials it. And you see VOL for volunteer initials. Those are your initials. So this says, the taxpayer says, yep, I did sign. And you sign, initial saying, yep, I saw him sign or her sign. Do not put in the transmission date. That is the last thing that happens when the site coordinator or whoever I, later that evening or the next day, whenever they actually do transmit the return, they will write the date in there. So you leave that box empty at this time. But you and the client initial those. Um, these are our confirmation for e-filing. That sticker has to be initialed because that's all we got now is that 13614. And the site coordinator or site manager later on gonna look at that and say, yep, it was witnessed. I can go ahead and transmit this return and e-file it. Any questions on that? Hey, so the going over the form with the client, is that something that the QR person does or the preparer? If you're if it's in person, that would be the QR person. QR okay. person verifies everything they write, they print it out, and then they move into this mode right now. They're giving it back to the client and going through it with them. Okay. If it's Thank not you. in person, it's going to be somebody that didn't take site, could be the same person that did the intake. But QR is already done. That envelope has come back. Um, you're at the intake site, and now this person sits down. You open up the envelope and says, okay, let's look at your return. And that's interesting. Usually it's okay, but every now and then you get a surprise as the client does. You look at that, and you have to you have to look through the return to make sure you understand what's going on. Sometimes you take a minute to look through it so you know what to explain to the client. Because you didn't do the QR, and you didn't do the prep. Good question. Anything else on that? Mark, and I, I expect this year we're going to have a lot of people surprised by a smaller refund, uh, you know, with all the child tax credits going away. Um, will be some people will have to explain to. Yeah, we will have a lot of that. Um, as I'm with it, I should have talked maybe, more about, maybe a little bit more about that last week when all those changes. Um, yeah, a lot of folks are not going, they're not going to get the child tax credit. They're not going to get the, the, uh, they're an income credit, some of them that they used to get. And it's not our fault. All we can do is that's why I want, I want you to understand that because you're not, I don't expect you to go through the math, but I, I would hope that we could at least say, you know, they, they dropped the limits back. I'm sorry, here's the sheet and you're kidding or whatever it is, but no, they dropped the numbers back. You don't get 6,000 a kid anymore. You only get 2,000. So yeah, that, that number is that going to drop back. So well, that's why those that that resource sheet again with all the changes I hope will be to be useful so you can understand. Yep, this stuff they they pulled a lot of the stuff back on them. Good questions. Anything else? If there's any returns or vouchers that are going to be mailed in, make sure they have the right address. The Fed ad has different addresses for different situations, whether you're mailing something in that you owe money or getting money or or um, amendment or whatever, make sure you got the right Fed address to give them. Now, Iowa is nice, and they usually actually write the address on the voucher or on the document. It's usually on the document that they want it sent to. Uh, make sure they know where to sign. 
and make sure the client understands the deadlines when stuff needs to go back in. If we are e-filing their return, but they are going to send in a payment for a voucher, make sure they know that we're sending in their return this evening. It's getting e-filed. But they don't have to send the voucher in until the due date of the, you know, until April. So they don't have to send their money in until later, but the return's going in now. And sometimes they scratch their head about that and just understand that processing the return is different than when the money is due. If they are mailing, if it's a situation where they have to mail the return or the voucher, and that can happen in some situations, um, tell them, you know, it's both, just mail them in together. Um, if you're doing it by mail, it's, it's probably better to keep them together. Since they got to, it's going to be delayed, the IRS is going to take, is not going to do the manual ones very quickly anyway. So you might as well just get them, mail them together. Any questions on that? Do we still put like the W-2 and certain forms together when they mail it? You know, you don't send everything in. Good point. I didn't have to, if they have to make sure mail in the return, yeah, make sure they they understand they're, I have to probably add that. They have to add the W-2s, the 1099 hours, those are going to have to be attached if they're actually mailing in a return. That is a good point. In fact, I'm going to make a note of that so I add it to this. So when this goes into the. Mark, um, would they be the original ones they have to send in or since TaxLayer will reprint them out? Do we just use those ones? Yeah, we can use those. Okay. If TaxLayer, sometimes with the amended returns, they don't get printed out and stuff like that have to be printed. But um, TaxLayer, for what they need to send in, TaxLayer usually prints out a copy of it, and that is acceptable if they're going to mail it, mail that in. As long as the IRS has got a copy of it. And with Iowa, you also have to include a federal yep. copy. Yes. May as well put that down, too. Yep. Good point. Thank you. See, you guys are all okay. Have to include the Fed. You're mailing in Iowa, and they need a copy of the federal too. So you do so a lot that of be part of our cases. process. Hmm? That be part of our process to print a second copy of federal in the cases they're going to be paper filed. I probably need to put out. Um, I think I'll put out a resource sheet on that because yeah, if you're mailing in stuff, there's a lot of extra stuff you got to print that you usually don't have to worry about. And we don't do very many of those either. We don't do a lot of them, but you got to want to make sure you do them right when you do do them. We do, we will do some. They do show up. Good point. Anything else? Okay. Um, staple the return if that's not already done. But there are documents, the tax return, their voucher. If they have a voucher, any signed e-file forms. In, into the white envelope. Now, all our notes and photocopies, our intake form, are, and the photocopies we've done, there's, don't put anything on your notes that you wouldn't want the client to see. Because if you want to, you just throw them back in the envelope. Sometimes the clients want them, sometimes they don't, or you can set them aside and have them shredded. The 13, 614C, we got to keep. Um, any other signed forms, if we don't give it to them, we should be shredded. Um, and remind them to bring the return with them when they have the taxes done next year. That's always, it's always, always good to have the previous year's tax return with us. And put that 13614C in the designated location for later e file transmission. Every site should have whatever the site coordinator set up saying, yeah, when they're ready to be transmitted, put them in this file drawer, pile them here, whatever, but put them where they need to go so that when in almost every case, and when they close, when we're done for the day, uh, then the site manager, or the site coordinator takes a few minutes and does all the transmissions when all the clients are left. That's usually the process. Doesn't have to be, it's not mandated, but that's usually the way it works out. Any questions on that? So now we've gone through a basic process flow where we've, you know, we've interviewed, 
We've, whether it's in person, non person, we've done the prep, we've done the QR, we've given it back to them. And now we've got to, all, we, all we've got left is a 13614 initial ready to be e filed. So, what happens with missing documents? This is the one that always causes us the most headaches. Okay. Again, we got this sticker on the, on the folders now. Um, the most missing documents are identified. It could be more than one of them. It could be they're missing a W 2 and a 1099 R. Um, there are cases where we really want that 2021 return. We got to have it. Um, anything else? You write in the notes field. And I'm going to, I'm, the suggestion I'm going to make for this is if that document shows up, the W 2 shows up, there's an X in the W 2 that shows up, you receive that W 2, you cross that off, and you initial it saying, yep, I got the W 2 from data, saying this is when it showed up. Um, what I don't want is any confusion later on, or I thought we're still waiting for a W-2 on this. No, the W-2 came in. I want that some manner clearly indicated that, yeah, we got the W-2. It showed up. I don't want their, the return held up because somebody thinks we're still waiting when we're not. Any questions on that? Mark, do we adjust the, the promise date to when we actually get the final documents? Yep, we'll talk about that in a minute. Good question. Okay. Try to identify, please try to identify all the missing information. There may be multiple documents, more things. If, you, if the W-2 is missing, you don't stop there and say W-2. Go through the full interview process. Complete the interview for all the, get all the information. And you highlight or circle those to remind the client. Okay, you, you got to bring us a W-2. You got to bring us your SSA form. Make sure they understand what's missing in the option. Here's the option that can happen. Um, they can bring the documents back to the current site and they don't need a new appointment. They can e email the documents, explain to them this is not secure. We do have a United Wage email account that the site coordinators can check. Um, it's not secure, but we do we have given them and they've done it. It's up to the client. Um, but in some manner, we need to get that document. Those are their options for getting them back to us. And George, you were looking doubtful there. Okay. No, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Prepare the envelope as, as normal. Um, there should be a label on it. If it's not already there, make sure it's got a label. Discuss the choices below with the client, with the site coordinator, maybe even QR. In other words, in some cases, you can't go any farther. We can't do anything without these documents, okay? So the client has to provide the documents. Um, it may be possible to prepare and QR the tax return to a certain point without the missing documents. Now that we can take what we got and move forward as far as we can. But even though, and this, I think the driver's license question would fall into this category. Okay, let's go ahead. We got all the other information. Let's go home, go through and prepare this and in either case, um, the rest, here's the, you know, we'll go follow the, the we we'll go into the next process. Put all the client documents, all the photocopies and all the notes into the envelope. The envelope stays with the client. We keep the 13614C, clearly identifying what's missing. And then we, each site should have a specific spot in a file drawer or someplace saying these are the, the intake forms that are waiting for the client to come back with something. Make sure the machine items are clearly marked. Um, explain that in some cases they come back because they're not gonna have an appointment. They're gonna come back and drop the stuff off. If we haven't done anything else prepping their return, we may have to go into a not in-person process instead of in-person. Because if you're really busy and you haven't been able to do anything, now this person walks in the door, it's up to the site coordinator. We may say, you know, I cannot handle you today. I'm sorry, thank you for the document, but we're gonna have to go into a not in person. We're gonna, we're gonna give you a two week window, come on back in two weeks and we'll have it done for you. You know, make sure in that case, they have no site availability and they don't need a new appointment. Now, if we've gone through most of the process, if it, in other words, you took that hour and you pretty much did the return except for that missing document, well, then they can, you can probably finish it up when they come back with the with that last 1099R. 
You can probably finish up when they come back with that. Now, if you're going to do an in-person prepare and you want to do it, if you can, so you're saying, no, you're missing that 1099R. Okay, but we're going to prepare your tax return as far as possible with what you got. You're missing your driver's license. We really need a valid one. We'll go as far as we can, get the return done. When you're all done, um, you put it into that envelope just as you would for a regular QR. Make sure everything, that missing stuff is clearly marked. Flag it is ready for review. Put a note into, you have a, you can put electronic notes in tax layer, put a note in tax layer, and then they wait for QR. Same as a normal process. For that QR, they perform the QR with the client, but do not, this is not approved or complete, so do not set those flags. But you've done the basic QR so you know everything we got so far is good. I mean, this person made an appointment, we took up their hour, we got as far as we could in that hour. So now, but we still hang on to the 13614, noting what was, what was missing, noting that initial QR was done. Again, we hold on to that 614, and then we remind the client about the day's hours for the site. Don't have to have a new appointment, but they take their envelope and they leave and when they get their document, the 1099R, they can come back, and we'll clean it up. Any questions on these? So in person, if they're missing a document, we do everything we can, tell them that what they need, but then they still go to QR and then they take the envelope after the QR, but they haven't, we haven't submitted everything. Right. And that's a judgment call because when that you make with the person saying, they're just missing this uh, this 1099R. They've told us a pretty straightforward one. We can do the rest of the return. It'll be pretty quick when they bring it in. It could be something that's complicated. Say, no, I don't even want to start your return without that document. In that case, we're going to say, you can bring that back and then we'll decide what we're going to do when you come back with it. But we can't- like, like you just Like you just said, we're assuming that, we're, that it's a simple thing that they missed. You know, maybe they forgot a W-2. Or you know maybe they forgot something relatively simple, but if they, um, you know, there are situations where if they've got forgot a lot of stuff, you you might take a different attitude about that, depending upon exactly what they've uh, forgot to bring along. You know, it's a case by case of judgment call. But if you can do it, I mean, you, you've got an hour set aside there. If you can do part of their return to a reasonable point, then it's nice you know, try and get that far. And then, like I say, at that point, you still send them off with the envelope, you hang on to the 13614, and you make sure they know what they got to bring back. And then, but they, when they come back, you try to clean it up. So and who cleans it up, the QR, per, QR, QR person or any taxpayer? We're going to talk about that right now, after, in a minute here. So um, missing documents, not in person at intake. If you find the missing document at intake for a not in person, you prepare the VITA envelope, put everything into that envelope, including the consent form, envelope saved with the client. We keep the 13614. Uh, make sure the missing items are clearly remind the client about the day's hours for the site, no new appointment. And to the question that was asked earlier, we don't start the clock until they come back with that document. They said, well, you told me two weeks. Well, you didn't show up with your W-2 till now. So now the two-week clock starts. The two-week clock didn't start last week when you were missing. Two-week two -week clock starts now that we have all your information. So that's when the clock starts when they brought that document back. That's when you give them the reminder sheet. In two weeks, come on back, we'll have your taxes done. And it has happened. It's not uncommon. Say it's happened a few times. In this case, they're missing the document. They have issues. And that's why we give them all their stuff and we keep the 13614. We've had folks that just never came back. Okay, that's their issue. We mark the 614. They walked in the door, but we don't we don't have any other documents. We don't have to worry about returning anything to them. They've got they've got everything. Okay, now. Jones thing, the missing documents come back. What do we do? Any questions on the previous process again? 
Okay. Make sure all the documents are there. I am guilty of this. Uh, came back and I checked and I didn't make sure that everything came back and we had to send the poor client back again a second time because of my, I was in a hurry and oversight. Um, update that envelope level, make sure we note that the document showed up. If it was emailed, we got to print out the document. Even if they emailed it, tell the client, they got to come in for QR still. So at some point they've got to come in and, and pick it up and, and go through QR if it's an in-person. Um, find the matching. 13614. And to your point, Joan, some preparer puts the additional data in. They still need two people. So one person puts in the new data, and we still have to have a QR person review that change. It should be pretty quick. 90% of the QR is done. I just added this 1099R. Did I do it right? And that's all QR really has to verify. So now then, QR finishes the process as normal. Everything's good. They print out the return, review it with the client, pull out the signature forms, all that stuff. So that QR process then finishes the way we outlined before. But they bring back that W-2. We still need two people. One person puts it in, one person QRs it. Any questions on that? If it's not in person, again, they come to the intake site, you verify everything is there if it's emailed. At this time now, you give the client the two-week reminder. If they emailed it, I think we can email them a reminder saying, okay, here's your information because they emailed it. We're going to work on it. We can email them a two-week reminder saying, here's the times and the hours. Here's when you come back. Now, did they physical document? If it was a physical document, did it come to the actual prep site? or an in-person, an intake site. At that point, the site coordinators have to coordinate to transfer the document and to locate where the 13614 is. So the site coordinators say, this came in, do you got the 614? Yeah, I've got it. Or, you know, make sure that we, we have to make sure we know where that 614 is. If it came to the intake site, then again, match it up with the 614, the site coordinator has to get it to the prep site and match it up with the right 13614. At that point, the process picks up as normal. Finish the prep, do the QR, get it back to the intake site, the client picks it up in two weeks. Question. Since we, since we sent them home with their envelope, aren't they gonna have to <clears throat> physically come back with the rest of the documents anyway? Or a not if if the if the issue was found at a prep site, you haven't sent anything back to them. If it's if you found it at the intake, then they're coming back to the intake. If you'd already started okay, prep is, on it, then you've got all gotcha. the documents. Good question. In uh in the case that the client send the email, the document by email. It's going to receive something back that uh, says like I was received by B, uh, Vida. Good point. We should probably acknowledge it. I didn't have a good point. Acknowledge. Need to acknowledge the uh, docs. Yeah, they should probably know that we actually that we actually received it, that we actually opened okay. it and printed it out. Okay. And I think that response should be include that two week notice saying, okay, we got your document. Here's the hours on the site. Come on back in two weeks or later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Who's actually going to have access to that email site, Mark? Is that just a site coordinator or? Um... My vision with Meredith, I'm talking to Meredith, is yeah, it'll be the site coordinators. We'll have the, all, each one will have the password to that email. I know when I, was, when I was using it, I, you know, I checked it at the start of every shift. I checked the email. It wasn't that big a deal. But if they're, if it's not in person and they're missing a document, we don't do anything with it other than mark what they need to have. And that when they bring it back, we get the whole packet because we don't enter anything if it's not in person. If you're at intake and a not in person, yeah, you don't have done anything. You say you've given them everything back saying, I can't send this to the prep site because I don't have your W-2. 
Okay. So please come back with your W-2 and then I'll send it to the prep site. If it's the prep site, you've usually started that doc, that return, then you realize, wait a minute, I'm missing this. So you've interrupted it, you set it aside, wait for it to show up, and then you resume it if you've already started the prep at the prep site. Good question. And I say it's not, once you get into this and actually actually physically start doing a couple of these, it sorts out. It, it It's, I won't say intuitive, but it's not, it's not, it's not very, it's not confusing. You figure out, yeah, this is what we have to do to get them through the process. Okay, now when it's all said and done, <clears throat> you've got everything QR, we're all ready to go. So now we're finishing an e-filing. These are the screens that you go through. Um, they were brand new last year. They're not new this year, but I'll step through them anyway. Uh, the steps go across the top. On this first screen, note the state return because uh, it's not displayed later until the very end. So it deals with the federal, but the state return doesn't show up in a couple of the other screens. So on this first screen, make sure you note what the state refund is, the details. Um, select what your filing option is going to be. These should be defaulted by the system. We do not do any input on the screen. I don't know what those numbers are used for, but we don't use them and system assigns them. We don't deal with these third party information questions. The fees, we don't have any fees. So we step through that screen. A lot of screens that we don't deal with. Total for any bank activity. Now in this screen, it only shows the Fed. So when it says um, pull, you know, and sum it all up, it's only talking about the federal total. I will show it up earlier and it will show up later. So when it says pull refund down here, you put in your bank account, that's only pulling the federal amount in for this case. These bank accounts apply, carries over to Iowa, but the Iowa information is not shown on this screen. So these totals have to go up to the Fed refund. Um, I don't think you have an option to split the Iowa refund between banks. I think it only does it for the Fed one. And I haven't done this. Has anybody ever split it between banks? I've never done it. It's there, but I've never done it. I never had anybody ask for it. But this is the information, uh, the routing number, the deposit, all this stuff. Um, bank account, checking your savings. And I should put that on the intake sheet. Is it on the intake sheet? Checking your versus savings? Yes. Very important. 90% of the time it's checking, but occasionally somebody wants savings and you got to make sure you get that right. So make sure they put that, they know which one it is. So do you and, have to click on poll refund button? No, you don't. You can type it in. It's just a convenience that pulls it in. You do not have to look at it. You say, if you want, if you want to type it in, you have to type them. This is only fed on the screen. That's what that's a little deceiving. This is only the federal one on the screen. But the bank account information will carry over and apply to the IO one. But whatever you type in here has to be, whether it's one bank account or three bank accounts, has to add up to the federal return. Um, then what I used to do was a paper check. I've never had them split. I've never had that happen. I never had, I've never had anybody do savings bonds. I don't know if anybody else has. If you go through this um, and you miss something that's required, you'll get an error and you have to go back and little red checks. And the bummer on this is that screen is tall. So it'll tell you the error. You got to scroll up and down the screen to find the error because it's not always obvious. It doesn't take you there. It just point, gives this and says, hey, you got an error somewhere. That's annoying. Um, this is, we don't input driver's license IDs. Um, we can, not, doesn't matter, but we don't need to uh, carry forward authorization. Now this screen isn't showing up in the practice lab. And I'm not sure if it's gonna show, I'm assuming it's gonna be there when we go live, um, but it's not, at least yesterday I was looking, it wasn't in the practice lab. And this is that fourth page of the uh, 13614C, the 5080. 
This does not affect their return. If they accepted or declined, just assign it here. If they accepted, then we use their zip, the current date and the zip code down below for the pins and the dates. If they decline, we don't need any pins and dates. They accept, we just using again, the, the zip code, there's nothing magical about it. This is the zip code and the date. It's just basically to satisfy the screen. Is the primary and secondary pin going to be the same? It can be. I mean, it should be, or is it that like matter. husband, spouse? It, does, or? it doesn't matter. I just, actually, it doesn't care what you put in there as long as you put something in there. And it's easy enough. We've historically, traditionally, we've always just put put their, put their zip code in both of those, one or both of those. And it's never been an issue. I've never heard of any, at least I've never heard of any issues or any, any blowback or anything happening because of that. If, if they had a magic five digit number that they wanted to put in there, you could put that in there. But like Mark said, using the zip code is the easiest choice. Additional questions. These are the questions at the back of the 16314C. They are optional. And notice at any point in the middle of this, you can save exit and come back and finish it. Um, you can interrupt and come back and finish it. There's these whole set of screens at any time. Okay. We don't do any custom credit input. We don't deal with e-signatures. There's a spot on the top of the last screen for e-signatures. We do not deal with that. Okay. Again, now here's going to get to the end. Now it will show both the federal and the state. It will show what kind of refund method you've, you've selected. And it will show the bank information. Now your screen made, this is, looks all jumbled. This is really, at least it was last year. I don't know if it is this year. Your, your layout of your screen in your particular VC affects how this appears here, how it lines up. So don't be don't be worried if it all gets jumbled like this. It's all still there. Sometimes if you widen your screen or go to full screen and play the game with it, that'll resolve itself. Or put the screen to a to a smaller resolution, um, not resolution, but in other words, shrink the screen a little bit. It's really weird, but uh, it depended. I know it depends on your screen, on your screen layout and setup. But all the data is there. There's the uh, Last of the routing number, the last of the account numbers down there with the asterisks. There's the taxpayer's pin they assigned. You have all this other stuff. So, again, those pins are assigned by the system. We don't mess with them. Here's where you print. Usually, drop down for the print. There should be a VITA option set up in there. Um, we're not going to be sharing any of these or downloading any of these documents. Um, I'm not sure if um, the email, this email copy, I'm not sure if that's going to be there this year. This is last year's, and I looked and everything was the same, but in the practice lab, that email option wasn't there, so I'm not sure how it's going to show up in the live one. The live one, uh, next Monday, the IRS will start accepting returns a week from Monday, a week from this Monday. IRS will start accepting returns through Paxlayer. Uh, we're not going to start till the 30th because because otherwise people don't have all their documents before the 30th. But the actual IRS acceptance of Paxlayer returns will start on the 23rd. You want to set some status flags um, down there. We may add some more. You can set them. Again, there's a drop down list of the print options. That you can print. Uh, if you're doing, we talked about IO return, uh, having to print a lot of extra ones. You can print, you know, federal and state two copies for it. So basically, you can short get a shortcut there, and you want to print a whole bunch of the of extra copies for the client. Do we do want to give them a VITA copy? But for the state and the federal, these other versions usually work just fine. Here's the uh, interesting the. Uh, the checkboxes, as we talk through all the processes, these are the two checkbox that are control to control the process, ready for review and complete. And the transmit button will show up up here. 
be careful of that. Don't click that until you were really, really ready for. I'm not sure it's even going to be active while it's in review, that the transmit button will even be active. But as soon as you say complete, it becomes active. We do not want it transmitted uh, until that site coordinator is actually ready to do it. Any questions on those? Where's the approved button? It, it's not showing up on this. And I think there is there. I think this screenshot when I was looking at it from the practice lab did not have the approved button, but it will show up at the same spot. Okay, That's somewhere question. in there. Somewhere in there, there'll be an, an approved button. That's where the buttons are on this last screen. And the approved button will be there will be there also. As I recall, it functioned last year. The complete button wasn't there. It was marked for review, and then there was approved. And when you click the approve button, that's when the complete button became active. And I don't know if that's kind of how it's going to perform, behave this year or not. We'll see. OK. OK, anything on then finishing up here and getting things filed? Yeah, the transmit button is for the, at the very end, to send it. Uh, there's also a transmit section with all the stuff ready to be transmit. That's why it's nice to do the complete button, because if the complete button is checked, then the, it makes it much easier for, that has to be checked before they can transmit. And it makes it much easier for the site coordinator if everything's marked as complete, because they can just grab it all on this one flow and get it all transmitted at once. Any questions on that? At this point, um, it's been, I wanna talk about amended in prior years and then we'll take a break. Um, things were very, there's some really addition, major additional things the last two years that are not there this year regarding earned income credit, uh, we're gonna advance child tax credit and the economic impact payments. So for both these cases, if it's an amended and request for a prior year, the strong suggestion we're making is not to have new volunteers tackle these. Because I'm not gonna revisit, have a session revisiting the 21, 2021 training. Uh, I'm not gonna set up whole Zoom for that. Um, no matter what though, if you're going to do prior years or amended, make sure you have a separate clearly labeled VITA envelope for each return. Could you try to use the, the year appropriate intake and, uh, and 13 614s? We will try to have those, we do have them available for the last two years. We will try to have them available at each site, some of them. If you run low, it's sick. photocopies are acceptable. If you say, I don't have any more, this is our last 2021 13, 6, 14, we'll find make some photocopies. That's fine. That works. Um, if an NIP client, somebody comes in, not in person, has more than one return to process, I think we need to give them a three-week promise date. If we're going to do more work than normal, um, they can, we're going to take an extra week. We've had, and I anticipate because of the because of the COVID and all the other stuff going on, maybe I, maybe I'm wrong. I think we will get more prior year requests than we have been have previously. I think we'll get a reasonable number of them. Folks, because of the of the pandemic and everything, did not get their taxes done, and they're going to come in and say, "Oh, by the way, I got last year's or the year before." Okay, we're going to ask for three weeks on those if we're going to do more than one. And each one gets its own envelope, and we rubber band the envelopes together. We try to keep the client stuff together. Any questions on that? Would we do would we do those at an in person site? We're going to talk previous? about that in a minute. Okay. Good. Good lead in. Okay. Let's talk about in person. Okay. Sometimes they're very diligent. They've got. Last year's return, they make two appointments. And that's good because now we have an hour for each return. If they made an appointment for each return, great. 
proceed as normal for each return. Fill out the correct, correct 13614 intake, and then we'll do the 2022 and the 2021 taxes. We can only go back with the town four years. I think 2018 is the earliest year we can do this year. Well, the you have <clears throat> you can you can get a refund for any return that you file that is no more than three years past the file date. So in 2018, for example, the due date would have been April of 2019. So the first year would have been 20. Year number two would have been 21. Year number three would have been 22. So basically, we're saying that uh, it, the farthest we could go back this year would be 2019. OK. We could, But we could do four returns. And then the other thing that I usually point out, because we have people come in with that with that really old one right at the last minute, I remind them that they need to get that in the mail now. They, they need to get it in the mail just as soon as um, as we have completed that return, because it's got it's 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 got to be postmarked before basically April fifteenth of uh, twenty twenty three. Okay. <clears throat> now, if they did not make extra appointments, so they got one hour and they've got three returns they want us to do, no, we're not going to get that done. And this is a site coordinator, site manager decision. Are we in a position we can inconvenience the other clients to spend all the extra time to get to deal with all those right now? And if the, if the decision is no, then the recommendation is do their, you got an hour, do the current return because that's got a current due date. Like Tom said, if it's really old, yeah, then you got a due date. But the 22 return has got an April due date. So let's get that one done. If they have a 2021 return, they're already late, 2020 and such. <clears throat> so process the current return, complete the interviews for those other ones, but we're gonna put those into a not in person flow. Tell the client, okay, we're going to do 20, because you can do them independently. They're all independent of each other because you're doing them now. So doing the 22 return now does not depend on what you're going to do for that 2021 return because it's not done last year. It's done now. So they're all independent to make sure you get all the documents, get the 22 done and say, okay, 21 and 20, by the way, we're going to put those we're going to set those, have somebody else do them, come back in two or three weeks. If there's more than one of them, it's three weeks. Come back in two or three weeks, and then you'll pick up these amended or prior year returns. Because we don't have, you only got an hour now, and we don't got time to do these. So we talked about then when they go back into that other flow for not in person for what we're going to do with those returns. If that, go ahead, Joe. If their three returns are all like one W-2, it doesn't take long. You can do the prior years if well, you a, can get it done in the manager, hour. That's a site manager decision. You can look at it and say, yeah, we can get these done now. But I want to say that I want to give you, give you give, I think we should give the option that if this is going to take four, three hours and, you, and, you're, and you're backed up already with clients, you're not going to be able to do that. You want to say, okay, I'm sorry, we can't do all three of these. We'll do your current one. <clears throat> the other two, you're going to have to come back for. Yeah, Mark, isn't there value in doing, I mean, I totally agree with what you just said. But from my point, in getting the information in from the prior year, so it carries forward for one thing. And then what about like uh, the question about federal returns, you know, for, for a state aspect? If you do like the 2022 and then you don't know what you've, what you owed or what you got back for 2021. Well, it doesn't you matter. Go back and amend that then, or, you know, no, because, is that an issue or not? Because it's all, the IRS works in a, in a current cash flow. In other words, if i am got my 2022 and my 2021 in front of me, I haven't done either of them. That 2021 return, since it's not completed and already done, has no effect on my 2022 return, zero because I didn't get any refund last year. It says, did you get a refund last year? No, because I didn't file taxes last year. Yeah, okay. Now, this is something we fall short on, and it's a whole separate topic of discussion we may have, is if somebody comes in, we say, show me your last year return, and we ask, what was your return last year? Well, if they filed three returns last year for three previous years, 
we should really be asking them, what are all the returns that you got last year? And we don't ask them that. We don't pursue, yeah, I got my 2021, re 2020 return last year, plus my 2019. Plus my, we don't pursue that. And theoretically, those will all show up as income for them, you know, on, on this year's returns. But we don't do that because it's the year you actually got the money, not the year that you filled out the tax form. So that's, why, really they're, that's why they're independent of each other. We don't really have a way of knowing, uh, not usually anyway, knowing that somebody filed three returns last year or two returns. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, it's very hard to ask the question because you have no clue about that. Unless you, you know, I, well, we don't even usually ask the question. And in theory we should, but we never have to my knowledge. And, and if, if we do a prior year return, um, if we really wanted to push to the limit, we should say, by the way, make sure you bring both of these back next year. But we usually don't say that. We just say, bring your latest return back next year. So we sort of flow into a gray area there about, you know, most of the time it doesn't make a lot of difference, but in theory, those should all be part of the, should be part of the current package. Another gray area that you run into when you're doing a prior year is that uh, in reality, you should know what their refund was from that prior year. Let's say if they said, hey, I want to, I want to do the 20, 2019, for example, technically we need to know what the refund was from 2018. So uh, that, that, again, that's, that's something we try and push, but that's very hard to answer that question completely sometimes. Yeah. And say, so, so whenever you get these prior year ones in these situations, you know, it's a talk with the site coordinator because it's it's going to be a case by case basis. But do know that I think you do have the option that if you're swamped and somebody didn't make the appointments and you can't afford the three hours right now, take care of this person, that we can put the prior years into a not in person flow. You know, do fill out the intake and all the information, but say, okay, we're going to have somebody do these. You come back in two or three weeks and pick them up. Any other questions or comments on that? So how many how many years back can we e-file? Last two? Um, two, I think 2020, I think we can still e-file. I'll go look at that. Good, good point. I'll go, I, I do need, I do an earlier one, yeah, like you have to, like are only mailed in really early ones. I think we have three years we can e-file. The system will tell you. Yeah, the system <laughs> tells you, but I'll be nice to know ahead of time. Well, that and that raises the point that Tom mentioned earlier, right? The 2019 ones will have to be mailed, so they got to be in. They got to yeah. be postmarked ahead of that April date. Yeah. I don't know if we'll get those. I I do say I do believe we'll see uh, more than normal on the 2021 prior year that they want done, and maybe some 2020s as well. One, one thing I might add about prior years is that it's possible that someone could come in and say that they've uh, they have to file uh, uh, earlier than three years, and the only reason that would be true would be if the IRS for some reason required them to do that. It's it's possible that the IRS requires them to do that. Um, we don't have forms here. Let's say if somebody said I I need to do a 2017 or 2018 return, uh, we at least in the past, we have not had the forms available to do those. Yeah. And like I said, the only reason that typically we've been asked to do those is because the IRS said, um, well, I've told them, I've given them a letter saying we have to see that. But as far as getting a refund, uh, the it only goes back three three years from the time that the return was, uh, was uh, expected to be filed. And then the other point too is that when you get if they owe money, you might remind them that they, um, even though you've calculated something, the IRS may write them a letter and say they owe penalties and interest that, that were not included in the return that we created. Okay, good points. Now, yeah. last year, and I don't know if it's going to be true for this year, the first two would electronically file, the last two I always had to print out. Because I had a couple of them that had four returns last season. That's the recollection I have as well. 
for amended returns, the back of Pub 4012 and Section M has a really, has a, they've had a pretty good flow instead of instructions in there for dealing with amended returns, especially if they came to us in uh, that year, uh, they came to us in 2020 and they want to amend it and it's in the system. Uh, it's pretty straightforward and not too bad to do an amended return. Um, if you get to prior years, as I mentioned, some really significant tax items for economic impact. Um, I'm going to take some of the key stuff related to that from last year's training and put it into a, 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 a little more, I'll call it consolidated or a uh, note slide deck. And I'm going to put that out on the volunteer site. So if anybody is doing a prior year and they have some questions about what we did for advantage child tax credit and that stuff, some of those things last year, uh, you can go out to that volunteer site where all the where this recording is going to be and some other stuff, and um, take a look at that slide deck and some of the stuff we had for those things. Um, I will review the intake form that we have for 2021, and I will make that available at the sites uh, if you want to use that intake form because I had those some of those questions related to that on it. And the other point on that, after this much time has passed, we always had issues with clients bringing in their letters, their IRS letters for those payments. Um, after this much time, I'm gonna say there's probably even less likely likelihood that those clients are gonna have those letters. So make sure the client, give, you know, they can take their best guess of, did you get those payments, how much? They can use the best guess for the amounts, but explain to them that the IRS is gonna adjust it. This is a case where the IRS has it in their records what they actually paid these people. And the IRS will adjust their return and say, yeah, I know you said $1,400, but it was really $1,200. And they will adjust the return and either send them a bill or send them an extra check. It will take a while. It'll be many months, but they will see that if it gets adjusted. So what I don't think we want to, we're in a position to do is beat these people over the head and say, you know, you got to go back and find those letters from 2021. Nah, I don't think that's going to happen. I think we take the best guess and let the IRS adjust it. Any Are they still running their website, Mark, um, where they showed that kind of stuff? You know, we could have looked it up a year or two ago for them, but um, with it's them. still out there. I don't know how easy it is to get to. That information I know is still, when I log into my IRS account, there is still a link to go look at that. But I don't know how easy it is to get to outside of that. Any other questions? At this point, I think we're gonna take a 15 minute break. Um, so it is 10.35, we'll come back at uh, 10.50 at 10 minutes to 11. And then we'll finish up with the rest of the stuff here on Iowa and the, uh, and the scenarios and such. I'm gonna pause the recording and uh, stop my share. And we'll go from there. Hey, Mark, uh, one more question. Sure. A lot of times we had elderly people that probably didn't need to file a return, but because of the old stimulus packages, we did it sometimes just so, you know, if you get one next year, they'll know where you're at. Um, do you think we should continue to do that or just tell them they probably don't need to do them anymore? Well, if, if they don't need to file, I always give them the option, at least me personally, saying, you know, there's no requirement for you to file. But I have had um, cases where they want to file anyway. They are say, I want to make sure it's my social security number that gets in there so nobody can steal it and do something with it. And that is not a bad argument. True, true. Um, but I just let them know, yeah, there, there is, you are not legally required to file. Uh, you're here. Won't take much if you want to do it. You got an appointment, we can do it. It's up to you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them, it's a hassle to come in. So yeah. if they don't want to do it, that's fine too. Well, at that point, you know, they've come in. If it's in person, you say you're here, you got an appointment, let's take, let's, let's knock it out. If it's not in person, you're at the intake saying, if you don't want to come, if you don't want to do it, you just have to come back again and pick up your taxes. If you don't want to do that, okay, um, we won't file it. But, you know, it's not going to take us much to put it in and file it. If you want to come back in two weeks, it'll all be done. Mark, I've had people that have simply indicated that they need to create a, re a return, a paper return, be 
because they're getting uh, assistant financial assistance someplace else, even though you know we know that they don't have to file a return. It's like I have to be able to show them a 1040 to get some financial assistance. So I know we've okay. we've done returns for that purpose, even though we know that we don't have to really they don't have to file. Yeah, subsidized rent and things like that could fall into that easily. Okay. Well, anything else? Otherwise, we'll uh, see you in 15 minutes. And where we are right now is I'm going to talk a little bit about Iowa since that's the next one we're going to be dealing with in a couple of weeks. We sent out some more scenarios on that. Reminders and changes for Iowa. Um, so I'm trying to, Iowa's always a little tougher to get confirmation and get data in some cases, but these are the standard deduction changes for Iowa. Uh, Iowa also did update their charitable mile allowance uh, mid-year for gas mileage. It went from 39 cents to 50 cents a mile, <laughs> starting for anything after July 1st. Uh, don't have too many folks that done charitable miles. I've run into that once or twice over the years, but we don't see a lot of folks that try and claim charitable miles. Uh, college savings, I have 529 accounts, allowable deduction per beneficiary went up a little bit. Uh, that goes, and that was not necessarily intuitive. You have to go other, under other adjustments in the tax layer in the Iowa place to uh, in the Iowa section, state section, to find that to put it in. Uh, qualified business income deduction, uh, for the federal, which you get for any self-employed, and also for some capital gains, generate a QBI. Uh, Iowa used to be 50% um, the previous year. It's 75% for the upcoming year. That should be 50% for 2021. Sorry, typo there. It's 50% for 2021. It's going to be 100% for 2023. For this cut for the tax year we're doing 2022, it is 75%. And that, can, that gets carried over by tax layer, but it's just a piece of information so you know where it's coming from. And uh, just a reminder that starting in 2020, <clears throat> Iowa started conforming to IRS law tax changes unless, so IRS law applies unless Iowa specifically writes their own law to, to change it. And that um, comes into play a little bit, especially come into play starting next year. And we'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks. What I think is new for 2022, um, over the, during the pandemic, they authorized a, a $1,000 premium, that's called either premium or retention pay benefit for peace correction officers, teachers, and child care workers. That 1K um, is, can be deducted from their income. And it's related to them working through the pandemic. They qualified. So I don't know if I want to add a question to the intake form or just something to remember. I don't know how many folks will get to deal with this. And I do not see anywhere right now in tax there. I'll have to investigate more in tax there about how we would handle that. I'm guessing it would just be, a, there is on the uh, reductions to income, you can just do other and reduce it. I'm assuming it would just be a $1,000 reduction in income for Iowa. Um, I'll have to investigate a little more on that, but that that is in the, uh, in the legislation. If anybody's got more or better information on that, please, you know, let me know, talk to, talk to me about it. And how, we would only find that out through the interview? I would think you'd only find that out through the interview, yes. Okay. Because they're just gonna have a W-2 and I don't know, I have no idea if it's gonna be specifically isolated on that W-2 or just something they know. Um, and it's tougher because the Iowa expanded 1040 are not out yet for 2022. As of yesterday afternoon, they had not released their 2022 expanded instructions, which is annoying. I hope it'll come out shortly so I can, because I really need it to get stuff ready for two weeks from now. This is why I didn't want to, why we wanted to wait until the 28th to do the training, because Iowa stuff is always a little late. What I don't know is what the educator expense limit, I've not been able to find out what the Iowa educator expense limit was. It was went up to 500. I don't know if it's still there or went up again or what happened with that. I don't know what the value for tuition textbook credits 
what we applied the 25% to. In 2020, it was 1,000. It went up to 2,000 last year. Um, but tax layer, if you look at tax layer, it says the limit's 500. And it says that for both last year and this year. So uh, I don't know what's going on because I don't, I can't believe they dropped it back down. So I do not know what the actual valid number is for that for Iowa yet. And I don't know what the uh, income limit on uh, child dependent care income limit. Iowa had their own income limit on that. Usually it was 90K last year. I don't know if that's still the case or if that changed. So those are a couple of them that I need to, and if the 1040 instructions came out, I can find all that, but they're not out yet. So that's where we're going in Iowa. And uh, I'm hoping to get to, like I say, I'm hoping to get better information. So we'll probably not send out the IO scenarios until uh, maybe next weekend. Uh, I'm not gonna send them out this week because I wanna make sure I got all the good information before I create them. Any questions on any of that? So the Iowa uh, tax changes for the no tax or retiree income, is that something that kicks in next year? Yeah, we'll talk about that in two weeks. That kicks in starting in 2023. Okay. There's a lot of changes that are going to make, make our jobs very different uh, filing at the end of a, <clears throat> a year from now. So, okay. so let's talk about our training scenarios then. Shamus O'Connor. I don't know, it'd be Seamus or Shamus. I have no idea. I never get how those how that one's pronounced. Um, different addresses. There's some things that came off that, and I'll go through. I'll just talk to these, then you guys can break up any questions or anything else you want to know about the any other discrepancies or any other issues you had with the scenario. It is not uncommon for our clients to have a different address on the driver. It could be a valid driver's license but they may have a different address on it than on their other tax documents. Our clients can move frequently. Um, for the return, we use the address that they have on the, on the 13614C. For returning clients, and because of that, if we pull it forward, please verify the address that gets pulled forward from the previous year. I've been burned by that because I was lazy and didn't check it because they may have moved from last year. It comes pulled forward and you got to go change it. That is not uncommon. Um, then the tax layer pulls that address that you put in into any other further tax documents you input. In other words, whatever you input for their taxpayer's address, the client's address, you can put a W-2, it's going to pull that in as the address. Try to remember to check those against the W-2. It's usually a W-2 or a 1099-R where we run into this where they've moved and that they had an earlier job and that W-2 doesn't have the same address as they have now. So we wanna try and edit that W-2 input for whatever the address actually shows on the W-2 or the 1099-R. Um, those two documents need to be identical to what the IRS gets, which yeah. means that they need to show whatever is probably on the document that you have in front of you as far as an address is concerned. They say there are some documents like those two that I also will flag as an issue if we have a different address than what they have on file for that doc for what that document shows. So you do have to get those get those straight. Uh, the other thing on this scenario was education credits. Tax layer asks you about if you have a previous year to 98T with box seven checked and a mountain box two. This deals with tuition or that was billed and paid in different years and such. Um, you guys can speak up. I've never seen it with any of the clients I've seen. I've never seen that on a 1098T. Maybe some of you have. Um, we but, used to see it all the time. This is George. We used to see it constantly. Okay. Well, then, because I don't know about the clientele, we've not, I have not seen it. And I don't know if anybody, George, you spoke up, uh, I don't know, Harlan, Tom, I mean, Joan, anybody else, you guys have seen that. I've, I've never seen it. Um, we can ask them, and we know, but unless they want to show us the previous years to 98T, we're going to make the assumption and check no for that box. Unless we have directly something directly contradicts it, either verbally or they show us the previous years to 98T, we are going to default to no for that and say, nope, we didn't have that previous, that internet. That situation now exists with that earlier 1098T. Okay. Um, 
And certainly we want them, we want to ask them. Uh, but I think 90%, at least in our case, the ones I've seen, they have no idea. They're just having their taxes done. They don't pay that they actually, they don't actually pay that close attention to the forms. They just bring us bring them in and have us do the taxes. It used to be the colleges were famous for putting it in box two instead of box one. But I think the IRS must have changed a law or something because <laughs> then all of a sudden they all switched to box one. Yeah. And the, the tax player checks box, they put it for a full-time student on their on that dependent information. Um, that has parameters based on age and duration of how much long they were in school during the year. So the 1098T can have that half-time student checkbox checked, but it still doesn't meet the requirements to check that box in tax layer. However, if that 1098T box is not checked, then we will never check that tax layer box. So it's it's they don't exactly sync up, but you have to be careful on that because um, just because they check that box in 1098T, they may not qualify in tax layer for the IRS as a general, as a universal, universally a full-time student. So that's something you have to pay attention to. Last names, and this gets in just in general discussion. Um, I do not remember if tax slayer never liked apostrophes. It didn't like O'Connor and with the apostrophe in O'Connor, the Pratchett Lab for sure. <clears throat> I know hyphenated names can cause issues getting returns accepted. And this is not, this isn't a tax player issue. Um, we need to match up with the previous data that was in the IRS for that social security number. And especially with the uh, cultures that have multiple names in various formats, sometimes it's tricky to get everything in there right so the IRS will accept it. <clears throat> we don't actually, sometimes we don't interpret correctly what they want to use for their last name. Um, and the IRS, they can, we can get them rejected. Um, Otherwise, you just make the client aware. And a lot of times we don't, when this happens, get rejected. In my experience, we don't have to go, we don't check with the client. We just play with the hyphen until it gets accepted or they're switching. But I do think we need to make the client aware that we may tweak that last name a little bit to make sure it gets accepted by the IRS. We're not going to totally change it, but we may adjust how this how the grammar is and the syntax on it to make sure it gets accepted by the IRS. Usually the social security Mark, card, what matches up, but sometimes not even that is right. Yeah, Mark, there's a there's a couple of uh, tables in the 4012 B, B16 and 17 that um, that kind of show how different names should get entered. And it shows that the apostrophe doesn't go in. Okay. All right. But it also has I never actually looked at the foreign, that's sounding, foreign sounding names also. <laughs> yeah. And we talked about this earlier, uh, the, who the primary taxpayer is. Um, the 13614C, it's not uncommon, doesn't match. You look at last year's return and they have one spouse listed first. And, but whoever spouse, whatever spouse happens to fill out the 13614, usually this is their name first sometimes, which doesn't match up. So you always, sometimes it's not uncommon to have to verify with them. Okay, whose name do you want first on the tax return? I know what you got first here on the form, but how do you want the tax return to look like? Um, and I say it affects what gets pulled forward because it, it will be only get pulled forward by whatever name is on the primary slot for the previous year. If you put in the spouse's name and it swaps, it's not gonna find the last year's return. And as I mentioned, if you really wanna play, if you really wanna pull it forward and they really, and they insist on changing it, you can pull it forward by the earlier year's name and then go into personal data and swap them after it's all pulled forward. Mark, the situation that I often find gets confusing is the 13614 has been filled out by the wife and uh, she puts her name first on there. And so when you start off the return, you sometimes start off thinking, well, hey, I'm going to put her name and her ID first. And like you said, uh, they said, well, it came up last year 
and and the reason it came the reason they had it last year and didn't come up now is because the husband was the first name so so your instructions about being able to swap those is probably a good idea from time to time but but that does happen where you get that mistake where <clears throat> because her name was the first one on the 13614 you 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 try and use that as the the primary this year and I, I should have put something in here on the other one if they if they are recently widowed or widower um because that a lot of times that you they want to you might want to pull it up and then swap it because the the widow now is going to go first on there and the the deceased husband was the first one that's the most common situation was the first on the previous years but yet since they if they died within one year then they still get to put both of them on there and uh, deal with them as a as a recent widower or widow so any other questions on that so any other questions on anything want to go over on o'connor anybody have any serious issues or hang-ups on that Okay, let's talk about the atoms. Okay, railroad income. We do see this, it's not super common, but we do see it. And essentially it's just an alternate way of putting in their social security and putting in their, their 10 to 9 hour pension. Only the railroad gives you two different forms. <clears throat> um, the blue one goes to social security, the green one is the pension. Uh, the other difference is the railroad one has no state information on it. There is no state withholding and no other state stuff on that. But tax layer um, has you input, essentially putting the blue form, essentially putting it into the social security screen. And if you noticed, it turned that railroad 1099R into a regular 1099R when it generated and printed out the 1040. So it just, that's the way it treats it even though there wasn't any state information on it or anything. And I just put a little quick there list. Those are sort of the, the field matchups um, between the two types of forms. So if you're trying to figure confusion about why where stuff is showing up, um, we're using the simplified method. Well, before I get back, any other questions on the railroad income? Is it normal that, um... Like in his case, he actually had a pension and then he got the social security equivalent. So they don't withhold social security in the old days on railroad, did they? They had their own system equivalent yeah. to social security. Yeah. Central. So they may just get the one and not the other. Yeah. Like if they don't they do have a pension. Get, you should not see both. They will either get the railroad 1099 or the SSA 1099. Right. But they may not get the annuity one where he had the actual pension. It might just be the Social security equivalent? It's possible. Okay. I, I think it'd be very rare, but it is possible. I think I've only seen one railroad one in three years myself. So, yeah. Um, and the interesting thing about that is the railroad forces you, it says you are required to use the, it does not have the taxable, taxable amount in there, and you are forced to use the simplified method with the, with the, uh, the pensioner, the actual railroad pensioner. The other interesting thing about railroad is the spouse gets a pension. She doesn't have to wait for the pensioner to die to get part of the pension. She gets a pension as soon as he starts it. He or she, you know, it could be either way. But the spouse starts getting a pension as soon as the actual railroad worker starts getting a pension. I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> but on that one, it's all taxable. It, there is no simplified method. All of that is automatically taxable. Now, now, for using the simplified method, and I'm going to put out a resource sheet on this, it's nice to have that field 10 from the previous year's worksheet, but it's not required. We can You can figure it out. As long as you got the birthdays, you know the month, year the pension started, and you have that box three or, in case the 9B for a regular 1099R, as long as you got those numbers, you can figure the recovered amount to date. There's a couple assumptions there which are pretty safe. Assuming the pension payout didn't change, not too many pensions, once they start, not too many pensions change. And the IRS doesn't change the lookup values in table two on the worksheet. And they have not changed those in the last 15 years that I was able to check. 
So those are stable. And once those two are stable, if you have that other information, you can actually calculate that amount that has been recovered. And if you don't want to calculate it by hand, I'll put it in the, in the spread in the resource sheet to calculate on your own. But there is a URL with a calculator. You just feed in those numbers, the, the box for your 9B and the birthday, you know, the ages and stuff, and it'll tell you, here's all your recovered amount. And it's pretty handy. So we should be okay when they show up with those 1099Rs with the taxable amount blank and the taxable amount not determined X there, then and remember if they if the 1099R has an amount in the taxable amount, if it's filled in, use it. I don't care if that taxable amount not that checkbox is there or not. If they give you a taxable amount in the 1099R, we're going to use it. So any questions on that? That's one we need to make sure we catch in the interview process, right? Yes. The start date of the pension. Yep. So I wasn't sure where that simplified method came into play in tax layer. Was that while filling out some of these? If you fill, the, when you fill out our 1099R or the railroad one, there is a little, and it's not big, it's a small little link there to text that you can check on the link saying, do you want to use a simplified method? Because tax layer automatically assumes whatever it, tax layer defaults to everything is taxable. It automatically fills in it. So you have to check this little link and say, no, I only want to adjust that with the simplified method. And then it'll take you into the simplified method screen. Okay, thank you. And is the trigger mark, I'm trying to remember, the trigger is on a normal 1099R the box will be checked that the taxable amount's not determined and that's when we have to use. Yep. That box will be checked and that box is two, I think it's box two or whatever, is empty. The taxable amount box is empty on the 1099R. Okay. And what else? Um, I'll, I'll put it in the resource sheet. There is, it talks about the general method. The general method for this recovery only applies to most pensions that started before 1986. Um, we're not going to get a lot of those. If somebody had a pension that started before 1986, but they, they've been around retiring, been retired for a very long time. And we probably so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry too much about spending a lot of time on that. Generally, we just go with the simplified method and be done with it. Self-employment um, with the Adams. It's nice to have the expenses properly categorized and then a tax layer screen. But as long as it's a qualified tax layer, just adds those all up, adds them all up to calculate, you know, the expenses versus the income. So as long as it's a qualified expense, it's going to get summed up no matter what field you put enter it in there. I mean, it's nice to put it in the right field, but it's all they're going to do is add it up. I do not remember if we had a discussion or if there's a special field for what we do with tolls and parking. I happen to put them in, in travel for this particular example, but I don't know if there's a better field to put those in since it didn't have a specific input field dedicated to those. Anybody have any thoughts or insight on that? Mark, I had entered them first in the uh, other category, I think, and where it allows you to actually put in a description of the expense. Okay, that'll work too. Like I say, they're all just going to get added up anyway. So, right. But that, that'll work. Um, <clears throat> it is, I think it's a little unusual to get both the 1099K and the NEC from the same company. You may get both of them, but maybe not from the same company. But I, in this case, I just wanted to have both inputs because tax layer treats them very differently. Uh, the NEC has its own form. You put it in there, tax layer then feeds it and it's captured in Schedule C and you have to, it's not changed in Schedule C. That's it there, it's got its own form. The K link on the income screen is strange. It just says, oh, go to, go to Schedule C and put this in. So all it's doing is kicking you over to Schedule C. And you, then you manually type it into the other the income field. So they treat them very differently, which is interesting to me. I'm not sure why. Um, 
that happens. But the confusing, potentially confusing part, if they have other income, if you've got 1099K income and other, some other income that's not on a form, they're both going to go in that same field on the, on the Schedule C. So you have to add them together and put them in that, that field where you mainly put stuff in. Whereas the NEC has got its own, it locks in, it's got its own field. Mileage. Um, I think most of our clients, if they're driving for a service, their log books are usually pretty good. They usually can tell you, they'll be able to tell you what their mileage was before July 1st and what it was after. But if they don't, my suggestion is I, I think we're safe uh, in, in good faith effort and good conscience just to divide their mileage between the months of the year. Like I say, they this person was driving nine months of the year. Just divide the mileage per month and put the three months ahead of the July 1st and then six months afterward, the months that they're actively driving. If anybody has heartache or is concerned with that, uh, speak up and let me know. But I don't know what else to do aside from telling the client, we can't do your taxes. You got to go home and figure this out because all they're going to do is make up some numbers and come back. I mean, so we take their made up numbers or we can um, essentially divide it by month. I mean, they may give you some, give you some hints. They may say, no, I didn't drive much, much before driving. Then maybe you can, you can adjust it that way. But I don't think it's a huge deal or a major issue with the IRS if we don't get that completely to a gnat's hair divided accurately by July 1st. It, it seems a little bit odd because we do have to check a box that say that that says they have detailed written records. So, well, we don't have to. Uh, true. They don't have detailed records. We don't check the box if they don't. If it's all verbal, and I've had that happen, I've had that say, "Then yeah, this is roughly." I think they jotted it down, but they didn't have detail. I I have not checked that box. I have gotcha. had that happen. And estimated taxes. Um, the IRS does not send you a form listing what you did for us to make estimated taxes. You can go on their website, you can go online and spit out a printout of what you did for estimated taxes, but they do not automatically send you. There is no 1099 form that says, here's your estimated taxes that I know of, that I could find. Um, so generally we take their word for it, what they paid for estimated taxes. Um, if things are skewed, in other words, they only had one estimated payment for the full amount in the last quarter. Um, okay, we take what they give us, but we remind them again, this is your return. The IRS, we say the IRS may not like that. And the IRS may not may choose not to come after them, but I do know the IRS tends to frown. Their goal is to have a more roughly equal distribution through the year for the estimated payments. It doesn't have to be exact, but it has to be somewhat equal. And if you're going to load it, they'd rather have your front loaded. Um, they're not, they, they don't uh, smile on doing all your estimated taxes in December and not withholding them thinking you're done. They want their, some of their money during the year. So I know it used to be a while back and I'm sure it's probably still true. They'll come and they'll nail them for doing that. Yeah, I say that, I'd say there's a slight chance the IRS catches that, they, they may send them a letter on it, but just a warning to them. But if they say, that's what I did, then that's what we put in the tax return. I, I, know, I mean, technically it's, technically it's due when, when you had your income. So if you get a huge bonus in the fourth quarter, yeah. it's not really due till then. But I don't recall, is there a place in tax layer to adjust where the income came in? Well, in tax layer, you got it gives you the four quarters. It says it got March fifteenth, June fifteenth, September fifteenth, and January. They give you an extra month for the last one, January fifteenth, and you just put in. That's all you can put in is which which amount you put in that quarter. It doesn't. If you didn't pay it on March fifteenth, you paid it on March. Doesn't matter. That's where you put it in. But I don't know that there's a way to show tax layer that hey, all the income was backloaded in the year or no. front loaded in the year. No, I don't think you do. So they'll, you just, they'll get into that with the IRS auditor, I guess. Yeah, they'll get into that with the IRS if they want to. I mean, it's up to the IRS. If the IRS wants to, they can look at their income 
that again, that, that would be your response to the IRS letter saying, hey, um, these the 1099R that all came out in December, so that's when I did the estimated taxes. And that would be your response to that letter. Good question. Anything else on these? Uh, to go back to the question about mileage and evidence, written evidence, do you know how the IRS reacts if that box is not checked? No, I don't. I've never had any feedback on it. So I do not know what the IRS... I suspect if you're, if you're claiming 50,000 miles and you don't check that box, they might take a note if you've only got claiming 600 miles for your business and you don't check that box. You know, I'm, I'm guessing it, it would be a judgment call from them on looking at the rest of the data, but I have not had any feedback or knowledge of what the IRS does with that box uh, not being checked. Okay. Good questions though, anything else? Mark, for a, on a self-employed tax return, uh, if the person uh, paid the self-employment tax, I assume that that amount from the previous year would be deductible as an itemized expense on Iowa's return? Um, no, if you look at, actually, it's just the opposite with Iowa. Um, because that's all, well, we'll get into 2023, but when I will, when you go to Iowa and say, okay, I paid $2,000 in, in federal taxes. Well, the deductibility for Iowa is for income tax. Self-employment tax is actually a, a payroll. And so it is not an income tax. It is actually a payroll tax. So when you come back the next year, Iowa says, wait a minute, $500 of your 2000 wasn't income. I want to tax that now. So actually, you are supposed to add that, so 500 self-employment tax, back into your income for Iowa the next year. Now, we do not spend a lot of time doing that. I've seen a couple of the diligent folks and the volunteers have done that, but uh, we have not been consistent or diligent in pursuing all that on that IRA return and filling that in because self-employment tax is not income tax, so Iowa wants to tax that. And so it's actually not a deduction, it's an actual add back in for income. Does that make any sense or is that confusing? No, that's helpful, thanks. And I've, I've debated in the, both last year and this year about putting that, but we've been, it's such a pain to try and pursue and do things about that. And we've never actually been diligent about it. And I've never heard about anybody getting in trouble with Iowa. Nobody's ever said, yeah, they, I, they came back at me in Iowa because they didn't put that in. So um, somebody wants to turn me into the Iowa IDR, I suppose they can, but I've never pursued that as part of the training. Any other questions on Adams? Anything else you want to go over with that scenario? Okay, wow, you guys are pretty quiet on this. Okay, next the next steps. Um, two weeks from now, we're going to do Iowa taxes and latest updates. I'm hoping to get three scenarios out. I will probably take for the most part, I will probably take scenarios that you've already seen and just tweak them and add some stuff and add the Iowa portion of it. We ignore the Iowa portion up till now. I'll add some stuff in and probably enhance those. And then just so they make it be a little faster for me and then uh, a little clearer for you just go in and take your existing input in the practice lab and modify it and tweak it and add the Iowa stuff. Um, and to the, what I mentioned earlier, for Meredith's uh, request, please go in and make sure you're signed up for the sites and times you can support. I've already had one person mention that they didn't have the sign-up links. If you do not have the sign-up links, uh, I'll be checking my personal and my uh, United Way email here uh, yet later today before lunch. So please let me know if you need those links to sign up. I will send them out. 
Um, like I said, she she really wants to start opening up slots for people to sign up starting um, early next week. And she also wants to look and balance. We had a, I don't call it an issue, but he had a, some challenges last year where we had a lot of prep, a lot of stuff done, and we it was sort of hard to keep up with the QR in some cases. And so we're trying to balance doing the prep and the folks doing the QR is, we're going to take a little closer look at that. She wants to take a little, little closer look at that this year, try and make sure we can do all that and make sure it gets balanced. And she needs the data about who's going to be where to try and do that. So any questions on that? Is there any way you can see like all of the places and what's there? I may have some extra time. So it's just hard to go into each click into each of the links, look, go back, see what, okay. she I mean, is a spreadsheet. She, she, I don't know if she sent it out last year, I think to everybody, and she is already building it, which is just a big spreadsheet with every site all the times and who signed up for those times. I will nudge her when I talk to her and you can say, go ahead, feel free to send her an email on it too. Say, you know, we would really like to see that sheet so I can see it all in one place. I hear what you're saying. It's, not annoying, but it's yet yeah, it's not convenient to have to open each one individually to try and compare and say, well, what's at high waffle, what's at St. Mark's, what's at St. you know. But she is making that sheet. Okay, perfect. And I will try and thank uh, you. Try and make sure that she gets it sent out. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Mark, can you remind us of what the um United Way website addresses to access this information. Well, let me see. Let's minimize this. Let's see if I don't matter what I'm going to open. If I See if I can find it this way. I've got it in my email, I know. I think. There it is, Middle East and Iowa. Mark, it showed on the right side some links, and one of them was a volunteer site. Yeah, but oops, sorry. But I think what she was doing, it wasn't directly available from the website. The address is vita-volunteer. After? After uweci.org. I just put it in the chat. If you want to look okay. at the chat? It's got the link in there. Ida Dash Volunteer. Correct. There it is. Okay. Click here to sign up to view training windows, resources, resources. It'll be under. Um, it'll be under the not the videos, but it will be under one of these resources. I don't know if I'm going to add another resource. It will probably be under. I'm going to put it under the returning volunteer resources, but uh, that's where the recordings are under here and all the, um, the scenarios and all the other stuff they're putting under here. And the new volunteer, I think, new volunteer, I think it was just for the training. I think from now on, everything's going to go under returning volunteer. New volunteer was just for the new stuff that was different last month. So I think everything from now on is going to be under returning volunteer resources. Spreadsheets, the, the slide decks, my resource sheets, I'll put them, I'll send them out, but I'll also have them put under there, those kind of things. Yeah, but it's, you know, the organ that is Vita-Volunteer. Thank you for that, Patty.
Yep, and yeah, and Brian put it in the in the chat. And I got another question questions in the chat here. I'm really about the Joe asked about what measures are in place to remind taxpayers of what to bring to an intake. Um, I don't know. I'd have to ask Meredith what she's got for the folks when they're signing up. Um, what we do, I know we do remind them, but I don't know the details of what the reminder looks like. Um, when they call, because they have two ways. They can go online. They have their own sign-up option through an app or online. And I don't know. I haven't looked at that myself. I don't know what it looks like. Or they can call a number at United Way, and it gets answered, and then they can schedule. But I do not. I'm sure the folks that answer that phone are supposed to remind them what to bring, but I don't know what that list looks like. But that, as far as that's the extent of what the reminders are, is whatever that person who answered the phone tells them, and whatever is listed on that um, sign up app when they go to try and sign up for their own for their own uh, appointment. It'd be nice if we could really make it more extensive. I don't know what our options are on that. Good question, though. Isn't it also on the envelope that we give them with their items on it? In oh, from the previous year, yeah. Yeah. I mean, once they've come back, once they've been through our program, we certainly hope they remember what to bring. Uh, it's mainly the folks that are first timers that. that uh, show up shorthanded a lot. That information shows up on the um, link for clients coming up, but doesn't have the schedule yet. There's like a an FAQ that shows what should I bring, et cetera. Okay. How do I schedule an appointment? Um, and this came out on a, cause I, since I did my taxes through VITA last year, I got a postcard and it, it gives you the information and directs you to the website for signing up. Okay, good. I had not, I had not investigated that. Thank you. Anything else, the folks? So any other final questions? Hey, Mark, I'll bring up this uh, situation. Um, very often we'll have people that will come in the door and, uh, you know, did you bring last year's tax return? Well, I had it done here last year. So they didn't bring it. And so maybe my question becomes who, who should be printing off that last year's return at that point? Should that be the person that the, uh, at the, Intake the intake specialist when they drop it off. I mean, I'm I'm, or should that person wait until it gets into the uh, preparation office? I would say the person, the intake person, because sometimes they say we did it, but we didn't do it. Yep. I yeah, and I agree with you that it it really needs to be the intake specialist that prints it off because at that point you can come up with questions that you really didn't have answers for until you actually see it. So that, that situation comes up fairly often, unfortunately, where I did it here last year, so I didn't bring it in. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. And the other part of that, that too, is people are, people are constantly confused about AARP and, and United Way as well, although AARP didn't do them last year, but you know they're constantly confused about those things. The other thing with that is they come in and say, you guys did it. Well, to United Way, we, we may have done it, um, but it may not have been that site. So you have to make sure whoever, we want to print it out as soon as we can. And it may need to be somebody who has a login for a different site. I mean, if, you, if you're if you only working at, at Horizons, maybe all you've got is an H name login. Yeah. But they had it done somewhere else. And so you have to have a login one or the other. They make us for those for the new people. They IRS makes you have a unique login 
for every IRS identified site. So some of you are going to have three or four logins. And it's usually, it's a, it's a letter with your name after it. So you're going to have a, a an H name login for Horizons. We'll have a U name login for United Way and whatever else they come up with for the other sites. And if we did it on another site, we can get to it, but we may have to log into that site to grab it. Um, so we have to have somebody that can get into that site and print it up and pull it. The other thing, um, United Way, well, Vita did it last year well. It may not have been our Vita. And so we still don't have access to it. So that's all you have. As soon as somebody says that, and got like to time point, we need to get try and find it as soon as we can. Because if we can't find it, then we have to ask them, can you, you know, do you even have it at home? You just didn't ring it, you know then please go get it or, and I didn't, well, I I didn't put a slide in here. I didn't put my slide in here on IRS information. I'll try to remember to put that in next, but there is a, you can go to the IRS site and without logging in, request a transcript to your latest mailing address. Um, so they can get a transcript in five, mail to them in five days if they don't have it or if they don't have an IRS login, but they have to wait for it. Well, I recall one last that. year where somebody had done it themselves or, you know, so they pulled up on a phone. We wrote, somebody wrote down the refund amount, but they didn't bother to figure out which non-refundable or yeah. refundable credits were used. And so you had to go track that down later. So you really do need a copy of the, of yeah. the actual printout. And that is, you know, we've run into that several times. Just some they did TurboTax last year. They didn't want to do TurboTax this year. And their returns online, they didn't bother printing out. Well, I'm sorry, somehow. I have allowed them to log into TurboTax on one of our computers and print it out. That works. Uh, and if you have to show it to you on the phone, then you, have, you got to remember to get all the necessary information. Jot it down. Is that a possibility that they can email that tax return to the... Uh, the Gmail. They could if they if they if they're going to say let them know say you know this is not a secure. Okay. Email. If you're comfortable, you want to do that, we'll take it. But understand what you're doing. Okay. You know because they're they're responsible for it. It's their email. Maybe we will take it. Good questions on that. Anything else we want to go over? Or review. <laughs> If anybody's interested, I put the link to the client site in the chat so you can go look at it yourself. Okay, thank you. So take a look at that. Yep, late January 2023. Well, yeah, what should I bring to my tax return? There it is. Okay, how do you schedule? Okay. It looks like they need to update some of the information. It's still yeah. telling people to bring their economic in income payment. Yeah, so letters, letters. On that, uh, yeah, yeah, this stuff needs to be updated. Here's your general proof of identification, wage and forms, global health care. Yeah, yeah, this has to be updated too. The letters are not there, stimulus payments, finished child tax credit. So I'll I'll remind Meredith about that. Good questions. Good points. Thanks, Patty. Anything else? Hey Mark, this is Shelley. The uh, meeting on Thursday for site coordinators, the Zoom link is, did that come from you or from Meredith? I'm trying to find it. That came from Meredith. Okay, all right, I'll look under her email then. Yeah. yeah, that was, yeah, that's Meredith's setup. Um, <clears throat> oh no, yeah, that, I did, I did not send that one. Got it, thank you. Anything else? 
Well, I'm glad everybody. So two weeks, we'll talk about Iowa. Again, I'll try to get some scenarios out like next weekend. I'm hoping the uh, expanded 1040 comes out this week because um, I rely, I'm going to rely on that for a lot of information. Um, previous years, we have had an Iowa tax mail put together by some volunteers for Kirk. I don't know if it was Kirkwood or some other places. And I've got last year's. And it's, even though it's last year's, it's very helpful an Iowa manual um, for your tax layer and such. I will ask Meredith if we can get copies of that printed and have at least a copy at every site. And if any of you want a uh, PDF mailed to you on that, email me and let me know. I don't know if I want to send it out. I don't email with that for everybody. But uh, if folks do want a copy of that last year's manual, I'll send it out. I do not know when they're going to, when and if they'll come out with a manual for this year for Iowa or not. But um, again, I will do some scenarios. We'll talk about um, some of those. I hope to clarify some of those 2022 tax changes for Iowa. And then we'll have some discussion about 2023 for Iowa. It does not affect what we're doing for the taxes directly this year but it will very definitely uh, potentially impact what we tell clients if they ask us questions and what's going to happen next year. And I think uh, we need to be aware of it so we know going into next year uh, what's going to happen or not happen. Because they're throwing some, they're really throwing things, turning things topsy-turvy in a lot of cases. Um, <clears throat> I tell you basically, I'll just verbally, yeah, the retirement income for almost everybody is gone. Um, the deductibility of health insurance premiums is going to be severely restricted. Um, the mail, mar married joint filing separately is going to be gone. So you're either joint or you're separate. There is no, the, no, no none of that. Be none of that. Like this will be our last year for trying to balance back and forth between the two sides on, on the one form. Uh, I have not figured out what they're doing with the standard deductions yet. And that's my big confusion point after I get standard up. Um, it looks like my, it looks like Iowa is gonna, is just accepting the federal taxable income as a starting point. And then we might tweak it based on, you know, additional mileage or some of the other things with the retirement, which means Essentially, we'll be done going by the federal standard deduction and itemization limits. But I have to confirm that that one I'm still up in the air on. But they, those are all the um, federal deductibility goes away on the Iowa. Sort of. There's a trend. We'll have to talk about the transition period on that. Um, but it, it, it's going to be very, very different doing ta Iowa taxes a year from now. And what I'm worried about, I'll talk about, we'll talk about again next week is the clients say, well, I was so different next year. What am I going to do? Well, we're not tax advisors. Um, and I'll have to think about what I would do for a response for that question if a client asked me that. Because um, I think I don't want to sit there and shrug my shoulders, but I want to be very careful about what we tell them. Any other questions, anything else anybody wants? Otherwise, I think we're done for now. Mark, do you know if they're going to change the uh, 529 um, deduction for Iowa then what that changes? I have no idea on that. Okay. I have not seen anything specific to that. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means all the lists I've looked at that the that the IDR has published and, the, and blogs from the IDR and stuff, that, that topic has not been listed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then. Thank you, guys. We'll uh, let me send out some emails and I'll see you back on Zoom in a couple of weeks. And the site coordinators, I guess we'll see you guys in a few days. Thank you, Mark. Thank Thanks, you. Mark. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Mark. 
So, Mark, um, I have a 